Well, good evening, everyone. Certainly glad to have you with me tonight. We are talking about the question, why do you believe what you believe? And I think this is going to be a very important study. I hope you will be benefit. It will help increase your faith as it does mine. And um, let's get started. When I think about America, and of course across the world, um, but particularly I'm talking about America, we see that we once lived in a, what I call Acts 2 culture. What I mean by that is we lived in a time where it was assumed. It, uh, a lot of people actually uh, took it for granted that the Bible was the Word of God, and they saw it as a some kind of authoritative book uh, for their lives, a guide for their lives, and it was, and it was easy or easier back then to get a Bible study. And you'll remember in Acts two, there were some shared common ground, right? We see it as a case that there were Jews there in Acts two. We see that Peter he uses the Old Testament scriptures to uh, use for his points of evidence. And showing that Jesus is the Messiah and how he fulfills the prophecies that are found in the Old Testament. And so we see as a case that uh, we there is that kind of evidence that people would, would have accepted and therefore they would have trusted and obeyed Christ and obeyed the gospel. But unfortunately, uh, we don't live in those times anymore, do we? We live in a time in an Acts 17 kind of culture. An Acts 17 kind of culture is described in Acts 17 where Paul went to Athens. He saw that the city was given over to idolatry and his spirit was provoked within him. He saw that there was a, a, a plurality of ideas and a marketplace of ideas being taught there in Athens. And we know that he talked about Jesus and the resurrection and some mocked and some were curious and wanted to hear something new and we see that even Paul didn't even not even quote the scriptures the Old Testament to them because he knew that they were not familiar with the Old Testament and he knew that he needed to point out some evidence of the creator and how that creator loves them and cares for them and wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. He even quotes from the poets uh, that they knew. Um, one was uh, around 250 years before Christ, I believe it was, and where we are his offspring, God's offspring. Um, so we see the case that in America, um, and maybe in some other places of the world, that's where we have to start. We have to build upon some pieces of, of this strong foundation of evidence in order to help people to come believe, to believe in the Word of God and to believe that God exists and that Jesus is the Son of God. And there's one question I'm going to be asking uh, along, this, along this way that I want you to keep in your mind. If Christianity is true... Would you obey it? Notice the conditional of this. If it is true, would you obey it? I hope that people are honest enough to really look at the evidence and see that it is a case that there is so much evidence for God, the God of the Bible, for the Bible being God's word, and also that Jesus is God's son as we will go through this. So what I want to start with is the three laws. The three laws are the law of identity, the law of excluded middle, and the law of non-contradiction. We all assume these laws. I mean, you may, uh, you may never have put it in these categories, but believe me, you think about these things in these ways. We all do. And the first one is the law of identity. So, for example... I know this is going to be so deep. Oh, it's going to be so deep that you won't be able to even pl uh, plummet the depths of this. No, I'm being sarcastic, of course. A equals A. A car is a car. The Bible is the Bible. A microphone is a microphone. A mouse in the computer. <laughs> a mouse is a mouse, right? So you can see the case. So that's something that we recognize. Also, we see the law of excluded middle. 
it either is a car or it's not a car. Oh, that's pretty deep, ain't it? Oh, man, that's so deep. That's so philosophical. No, that's, that's pretty simple to understand, right? A car is either a car or it's not a car. And then we have the law of non-contradiction. Now, the law of non-contradiction, and you'll be able to understand this very quickly, two contradictory statements cannot both be true at the same time and in the same way. So, for example, I can't, you know, there's no way I could say, well, the Bible is the Word of God, and at the same time say the Bible is not the Word of God, because either it is the Word of God or it's not the Word of God. Did you see what I did there? I used the law of excluded middle. The Bible is the Bible. Either the Bible is the Word of God or the Bible is not the Word of God, but it cannot both be the Bible is God's Word and not be God's Word at the same time and in the same way. So you see, uh, everyone believes in the law of non-contradiction. Um, uh, we, we know that he, a lot of those worldviews, the, athe- the naturalistic worldview um, and other worldviews believe in it. So that leads me to believe that since we all kind of share that common ground, then we all believe that either a supreme being exists or a supreme being does not exist. Now, notice I'm not using the term God yet or the God of the Bible. Um, and there's a reason for that, and it will show you later on why we're not doing this. So either there is a supreme being or there's not a supreme being. So I was going to show you that there is evidence that a supreme being does exist. Number one, design demands a designer. This is what's called the, te- the teleological family of arguments. So for example, if I were to show you a mousetrap, what is the mousetrap? Well, as you can see there, there is an order, there is a purpose, and there is an arrangement. You see the parts there, are, they are arranged in such a way and ordered in such a way that we see that, we, that you have to be put in that certain order and arrangement for the purpose of trapping a mouse. You put a piece of cheese on it, and of course you load that spring back, and then when that mouse comes toward the mouse trap, when it leans on the, uh, what's called, uh, you know, that cat, try to hits the catch there, then of course we see that it's going to spring, right? And it's gonna, that hammer's gonna come down on the mouse and kill it. Well, as you well know, I've never met somebody who actually designed a mousetrap. But you know something? I know because of the intelligence, because of its design, that design demands a designer. And so, look at with me if you were to go out to the beach. And let's just say you run across a a sandcastle. Uh, when I've gone to the beach when I was younger, you know, there's no way in the world that my sandcastle looked anything like this. I mean, look how meticulous and detailed that sandcastle is. Wow. I mean, the order and arrangement and the purpose of it, right? And sadly, um, it's sadly going to be destroyed at some point in the future. So, but anyone with a, you know, with a, with a decent amount of intelligence knows that somebody made this, even though they never met the person who did so. Furthermore, I've been to the city of Petra in Jordan. And uh, in Jordan, what you actually would see is um, what's what's called the treasury. And I just find it amazing that the people who lived here how they were able to carve this artist artistically out of solid rock. Um, I mean, just, it's fascinating. And nobody would ever say, well, you know, over millions of years, um, somehow the wind and erosion, it rode it away and it actually made this here. No, friends, nobody would believe that for a second. Everyone would believe Wow, design demands a designer. Well, how much more when it comes to the human body? Think about the human body and how complex it is. It's amazing to me the systems that make up the human body and how intricately designed it is. Design demands a designer. 
I love how what David said, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. David certainly is fearfully and wonderfully made, and so all of us are, who are made in the image of God. So design demands a designer, and that shows that this supreme being is wise and intelligent. Also, there would be the point of evidence called cause and effect. So either the universe is eternal, or it was made from nothing, or it was created by someone. That's the logical choices that you have, friends. Well, Robert Jastrow, in a book called Until the Sun Dies, says, The lingering decline predicted by astronomers for the end of the world differs from the explosive conditions they have calculated for its birth. But the impact is the same. Modern science denies an eternal existence to the universe either in the past or in the future. And that's certainly true, friends. The universe, it's not eternal. Uh, even the second law of thermodynamics would show us that energy is running down. It's, uh, you know, so there must have been a time when the universe actually began. And then the other choice of it was made from nothing. I want you to think about how illogical, how unreasonable that is. Because it would violate from nothing nothing comes. I mean, if I were to say to you, hey, I want to sell you some nothing, I hope everyone in their right mind would say, no thanks, because from nothing, you're not going to get anything, nothing at all. And then people talk about, well, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and a vacuum of space. Vacuum is something, friends. It's not nothing. Okay. So that's just really not the case. And I love how it only would lead us to, when we look at the universe, we would recognize and say it was created by someone. It had a beginning. And I like what what we just quoted about Robert Jastrow. Uh, he says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the final rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Yeah, welcome to the club. Because it is a case that it makes sense that a supreme being actually exists because of the evidence for that. I love Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Such a simple yet powerful statement. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, are, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Notice the paradox there. You're seen yet not seen. That You can see the power of God in the universe, the effect of what he has made. And you can notice that he is powerful, he is intelligent in what he made, because they are understood, though, what has been made, so people are without excuse. Indeed, if people, when we get to the day of judgment, no way is going to be able to say, well, Lord, you just didn't give me enough evidence that you exist. No, God has given us sufficient amount of evidence. But I think the, probably the most powerful argument of all is the morality argument, the morality family of arguments. And that is that objective moral laws demand a moral lawgiver. You see, friends, I hope that you know, re recognize Hitler and St Joseph Stalin and Mao in China. Uh, these were people who committed some great atrocities. Do you morally critique these men for what they, do what they did? If you did so, then you will know that you know in your heart that there is an ultimate moral law to which we're all accountable, to which we're all amenable to. And, of course, a moral law demands a moral law giver, which is God. And so it makes sense, friends, that that's the truth of the matter. As the Bible would say, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, 
talking about the law of Moses in this context. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. See, they knew that there were some things that are right and some things are wrong. And friends, everyone in the world recognizes this. There are some things that are right, some things are wrong. Murder, lying, so forth. And so when I put all this together, I notice that from these family of arguments, there's a wise, intelligent, powerful, resourceful, eternal. He's outside of matter. He's outside of space because he had to create it. And he is good and he is just. Well, who fits that description, friends? It fits God. Now, that brings me to our next question. Would this supreme being want to reveal himself? And that logical, either it's yes or no, friends. Well, let's let's just think about no for a moment, okay? So let's imagine that the answer is no for a moment. I want you to think about this illustration with me. Imagine you're a parent and your little baby has just been born. And let's just say that you just put it there in the crib and that's it. You do nothing else. You don't touch it. You don't hug on it. You don't, you know, don't talk to it. You don't try to feed it or anything. Now, would we consider that a loving parent? Would we consider that person a, a, a caring parent that loves that child? No. And I think we can say the same thing. Uh, if, you know, imagine, a, you know, if someone never revealing themselves to a child. Well, I want you to think about with me how much more that God is a God who is a heavenly father. Okay, so Acts 14, 14 through 17, it says, When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men who, with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, Notice this, he did not leave himself without witness. God did not leave himself without witness in that he did what? He did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. See, God cares for his creation. He has, in a sense, revealed himself to the creation, and he wants the creation to know him. In Acts 17, here's what Paul would say, and God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord, <coughs> sorry, seek the Lord, and the hope that they might grope for him. You know, the word grope means to try to, you know, try to search out, try to find. Grope for him and Find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So we see that if the supreme being wanted to reveal himself, how could he do so? How could he do so, friends? And I think that's the answer that we see it is yes. God would certainly, based on the characteristics we saw in the above family of arguments, that God would want to reveal himself. Now, we could say that there are some several options of this one as well. It could be temporarily. It could be that he'd done it through vo his own voice, through dreams, through visions, and theophanies. Well, very interesting enough, in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we learn that that's what he did in the Old Testament. God, who at various times and in various ways, spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets. We see God would reveal himself in a dream to uh, Pharaoh, for example, uh, in, in Joseph's time. We see that God would give a vision, right? Uh, Ezekiel saw a vision. Isaiah saw a vision. We see as a case that sometimes, if we go back, uh, a theophany, a, a manifestation of God's presence, uh, such as, for example, Moses seeing the burning bush. 
And so, and then we see it's a case that God's voice was indeed heard by these these people. But as you can see, it, it would be temporarily because, you know, God would speak, it would stop. God would speak, it would stop. And so it's something that's temporarily. Well, what about permanently? Well, he could do it so permanently, couldn't he? And that is through a written record. And I would suggest to you that what we would need, because there are, you know, very, there are actually various books out there that claim to be from God. There is the Book of Mormon, there is the Quran, and the Vedas, and uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and others. So, I want to say that a claim is indeed necessary condition, but it would not be sufficient because just because something claims to be something does not, in fact, make it true. You know, I could claim, for example, to be the president of the United States over and over and over again, but I could, I don't have any evidence to back up that claim. Exodus 34, 27, 28. Uh, we see that it is a case that there is a written record, which is mentioned thousands upon thousands of times. Like, for example, in this passage, and the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, which I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And they were made the Ten Commandments. So what would be our evidence for this? Well, number one, I would say that our main line of evidence is, of course, predictive prophecy. You see, you want there to be the details, specific details, significant timing, and that it actually is fulfilled 100%. Well, that's exactly what we um, see, friends. I want you to read about how God uh, went against idolat the idols. And here's what he says. He says, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. That's what he's asking the idols to do. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dis dismayed and see it together. And so what I'm trying to say here is, friends, that we have these idols here, uh, and God says, can they do what I do? That God is the one who, has in who is infinite in knowledge, and he can predict the future. But those idols can't do anything. And there is evidence for this, friends. I want to just give you one example. I love the prophecy of Isaiah 52 through 53. In fact, it begins in chapter 52, verse 13. Forget about the chapter divisions. Behold, my servant shall do prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle or astonish many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what has not been told them, they shall see. And what they have not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all what is this in reference to friends well when we go to the book of acts we see that the gospel is being preached it's been preached to the samaritans many were obeying the gospel being added to the lord's church and philip met this ethiopian eunuch so philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet isaiah and said do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and he would declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. 
You see how the eunuch was reading from what we call Isaiah 53? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet, prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Well, what we see there is that Isaiah had written this 750 years before Christ was born. And Philip was showing the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Now, a question that people might bring up is this. They'll say, well, how do we know that this prophecy in Isaiah 53 was not written down until after it occurred? Meaning that they would say it wasn't written down in 750 BC, but in fact, it might have been written down right, you know, after Jesus resurrected or right after the people disciples were claiming Jesus rose from the dead and right before Philip, you know, tried to convert the eunuch. How do we know this? Well, because we have what's called the Qumran cave, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in 1940s, uh, there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in, at Qumran near the Dead Sea. And one of the great uh, finds of that was the Great Isaiah Scroll. And it was able to be dated to around 200 years before Christ. See, that shows you the evidence that this text had been copied faithfully from Isaiah's time, 750, for, <coughs> for even that 500-year period when we see that it's you know copied to 200 B.C. And, of course, we know that Isaiah was copied beyond that because we know that the eunuch also had a scroll. And we see that that's even three, you know, at least 200 years before the prophecy is fulfilled. So if anyone wanted to say, well, maybe it was written, you know, around 200 BC. Well, that's still 200 years, friends. That's an amazing time frame. That's significant timing. And so we see that is a case there is great evidence for this. And there's 300 prophecies of the Messiah. Great evidence to show you the Bible is the word of God. And I love the unity of the Bible, the unity of God's Word, where we could talk about it in various ways, how it was written by 40 different writers over a 1,600-year period, or 15 to 1,600-year period, on different continents, who held, they held different occupations, they, some of them never met each other, and yet, just to see, for example, the way that they do it by the covenants, so, and Adam and Eve, God making a covenant with them. God making a covenant with Noah. God, we see that through the flood, there are those, um, you know, this would be such an, made an impact, an imprint on human history because Noah's descendants would have told their kids about this destructive flood that destroyed the human race except for eight souls. And we would expect that there would be stories around the world that show us that there is uh, that there was such a global flood. And certainly, as you can see uh, uh, here uh, from the book called The Echoes of Ararat, um, this man named uh, Nick, I believe his name was, who actually just did volume one on North and South America. Uh, but there, he ha does have a volume two, uh, hopefully in the near future, and I can't wait to read that one. But I think it's interesting just to show you all these flood legends around the world. Uh, there's also there's dinosaur graveyards in the Midwestern United States, and these are from secular sources of these dinosaurs that were buried in mud and sand and so forth. Like it says, a herd of dinosaurs died in a flood or some other catastrophe. Massive flood events may have killed thousands of dinosaurs at one time. These are secular sources. These are people who don't believe in the word of God, friends. Furthermore, we have the covenant made with Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Then there is David that God makes a covenant with that in through his seed, God is going to, through him, build the temple of God. Now, the immediate fulfillment of that would be Solomon, but the ultimate fulfillment in Hebrews 1 is Jesus the Christ. And so it's amazing to me how the Genesis through Revelation fits together that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He came to be the savior of the world. 
And then there's scientific foreknowledge. And we could talk about, for example, circumcision on the eighth day and how that uh, is very interesting in regards to the medical, the medic, uh, the medical, uh, uh, sorry, the, the medical knowledge in regards to um, vitamin K and so forth. We could talk about that. But that, to me, these are great evidences, evidences to show that this book was beyond human production. But then we have it permanently, not just in a written book, but the supreme being came to reveal himself in a human being because it's man that has sinned against God and it's man that needs to be redeemed. And so God came in the flesh and came as man, that he's 100% divine and 100% human. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared, he's exegeted him. When you look at Jesus, you can know who God is. John 14.5-9, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now, once again, we must, I believe, have a claim. A claim is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You know, I could claim to be the Son of God. Does that make it true? No, of course not. And you got to admit that, at the, you know, Jews during this time, for someone to claim their themselves to be God's son, man, that's really something, uh, that's something, you know, remarkable. And one of the verses I go to is John 8, 57 through 59. The Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, mercy, surely I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Definitely referring to Exodus 3, where we see that God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. And notice the after effect of this. Then they took up stones to throw at him. What did they, they thought that Jesus was committing blasphemy. He claimed to be divine. So we have the claim that's necessary, but we also have, do we have any evidence that Jesus is God's son? Well, I want to present four options to you. Was Jesus a legend? What, did he never really exist? Well, when you look at um, J. Warren Wallace in a book, what he did was he took all the ancient writers who were hostile towards Christianity. We're talking about Josephus. We're talking about Suetonius. Uh, we're talking about uh, Tacitus. Uh, some of these guys were actually hostile towards the Bible or t- towards Christianity. Um, and you can see as a case, friends, that these people, they, these historians recognize uh, Jesus to be a real figure in history. So he's not a legend. Well, was he crazy? Was he a lunatic? Was he out of his mind? Well, let me ask you this, friends. What crazy person would have come up with some of the greatest teachings ever? For example, when Jesus said, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Or this is the law and the prophets. We've heard that. The golden rule. What crazy person would come up with such a teaching? What crazy person could come up with some of the greatest parables? Certain men went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Or a certain man had two sons. We're talking about the prodigal son. Who could come up with such wonderful stories? Or what crazy person could defeat those who hated him in debate? I love how Jesus, uh, you know, they asked him, well, what, by what authority are you doing these things? And so Jesus replied and answered and said to them, I also would ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you about what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And so they, of course, tried to reason among themselves and they would not answer. And I just love how Jesus, how he expressed himself and how he was indeed the greatest logician there ever was. What crazy person could be the greatest moral example to follow? I mean, when I devote my life to want to follow this person, that he, whenever I think of 
who is the greatest example I could think of who's meek? Who is the greatest example of one who loves, who sacrifices? What comes to my mind all the time is Jesus. What crazy person could be that? And so that just just doesn't fit, friends. Well, maybe he's the greatest liar there ever was. Okay? Some people might say that, but it's interesting to me how the people in that day did not deny that he did miracles. They would, yes, say, they would attribute them to Satan, right? Say, oh, he's doing those by Satan, Beelzebub. And how Peter draws attention to this fact that he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Friend, what person could, could do miracles unless that God is with him? And so it cannot be a liar. You know, to claim that Jesus was just a good moral teacher does not do him justice. He either is, well, no, this excluded middle, he either is the Son of God, he either is Lord, or he is the greatest liar there ever was. He is the greatest deceiver there ever was. Take your pick, friends. And I would, I would suggest to you that indeed he is Lord based on this evidence that because he did exist. And we see as a case that he died by crucifixion. That's one of the great attested facts of, of history, friends, that he that the disciples were in despair. They were afraid. They went into hiding. And then on Sunday morning, there was an empty tomb. They found that the stone had been rolled away. They Then later on, the disciples claim that Jesus appeared to them after he had died. And that they were transformed, especially on the day of Pentecost, friends. We see them with boldness and how they're willing to go to prison and even unto death for what they believed. And then they spread the gospel, the good news, especially at the beginning there in Acts chapter 2. They do it in the city of Jerusalem where it all started because Jesus was tried there in Jerusalem. And it was on an early Sunday morning. That uh, that Sunday is a wonderful uh, day of significance because it is the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. The church that Jesus built began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and it's still here even today. And that even James, who was a skeptic in John 7, even Paul, known as Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church, what changed his mind? What changed James' mind is because Jesus in his post-resurrection body appeared to them both, and they became believers. They realized who Jesus is. He is Lord. He is the Son of God. And so, friends, we can't help but be like Thomas. After eight days, his disciples were in, again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the mist and said peace to you and he said to thomas reach your finger here look at my hands reach your hand here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing and thomas answered and said to him my lord and my god see thomas he wanted evidence and that's what he got friends when we put all this together we see that the supreme being is the God of the Bible. He has shown himself, he has revealed himself through those cause and effect, design and morality. We see that he's also revealed himself in the past through visions and, and dreams. But miracles were to confirm the word. See, he revealed himself permanently in God's word. But we also know that one of the members of the Godhead came down in human flesh And he came and dwelt among us and he died for our sins so that we could have the hope of eternal life if you will believe and obey the gospel. Remember our question we had at the very beginning? If Christianity is true, would you obey it? I hope that if you have an honest and good heart, that you're that honest and good heart in Luke chapter 8. Seed is the word of God. 
and seed will fall on that soil of a good and honest heart and will bring forth fruit. I hope that that's what you, who you are. And if you want to reach out to me, I'd be glad to help study with you more. But friends, this is why we believe Christianity is true. And there's a lot more we could go, go into. But I wanted to give a simple overview of this because I think it's so powerful. I really appreciate you being with me today, and we're going to have another lesson after this. Thank you so much.